Okay, so I got a lot of different responses to my interview with Chris Cantwell, um, the white nationalist, and uh, some of them were really positive, and some of those positive responses don't exactly make me happy, um, but that was expected, right? That, that some of the responses to me giving him a platform would appeal to people who broadly agree with him and his set of goals and uh, there's not a whole lot I can do about that. Um, and I got a lot of uh, kind of thanks a lot. You've just set the men's rights movement back years and stuff like that. Um, really negative responses. Uh, a few of them uh, contained actual arguments um, for Cantwell's position and against Cantwell's position, and I'm glad that it spurred a great deal of discussion. Um, there were certainly people who felt I softballed him in the interview, and uh, I would just, to them, I would say, go back and look at my interview with Rouge V. Go back and look at uh, the hangouts that I've done with Kevin Logan and Russian Deadpool and people like that um, on HBR's channel. Um, I'm I'm not a hardball interviewer in general. Um, you know, when I uh, accompanied Lauren Southern to the Slut Walk here in Edmonton a year or two ago, uh, she invited me to go and do her thing, which is to stick a, a microphone in people's faces and. Uh, and bark questions at them until they say something stupid. Um, and uh, I, I, I just, I declined that as well. That's not my style. Um, I'm more interested in hearing what people have to say than I am about uh, sort of doing a gotcha thing, at least in terms of face-to-face um, -face interactions. So that informed uh, my interview style with Chris Cantwell. And uh, I also want to let you guys in on something that you might not be aware of. You know, um, that Vice piece on Chris Cantwell. I can guarantee you that uh, the people who did that, who followed him around, were just as nice to him in real time as I was to him. Um, that, that's how they were with me and the other Honey Badgers before they uploaded their heavily spun piece on us. You know, the one they renamed... Uh, MRAs think rape victims deserve it or whatever the fuck they renamed it a few weeks after they uploaded. So, um, essentially, I mean, you're looking at, you're looking at an interview style that is, uh, designed to get people to feel free to open up to you. Jeff Charlotte, who did the hit piece in GQ back in 2014 on Paul Elam, A Voice for Men and the Honey Badgers, complete with pictures of Elam and others heavily photoshopped for maximum demonization. He was a very nice person in real time as well. Very friendly. Um, nearly every interview I've ever done that's preceded a hit piece has been pleasant and congenial. So the, uh, the, the primary difference between those people and me is that I don't then pick through the footage and select out the worst bits and then apply all kinds of spin to it. I just upload the entire thing. Um, I'm genuinely interested in what people like Chris Cantwell have to say. Now, why I was interested is uh, in Cantwell in particular is because I'd already seen pieces in the mainstream linking his current beliefs to the MRM as if what he thinks now is some kind of ultimate destination of uh, anyone who involves themselves with us, right? And uh, essentially, it's like Elliot Roger all over again. You, you all know it really doesn't matter what any of us say. That connection has become fact, right? Because Amanda Marcotte got it from Dave Futrell, and now it's being repeated all over the place, and that makes it true. So... Now, after seeing this happen uh, lots of times, not just with uh, Elliot Roger and the MRM, but with Gamergate and misogyny and all of that stuff, right? I'm not particularly concerned about these false associations anymore. Um, they're going to happen regardless. They're going to be believed regardless, right? People are going to say what they want, and you say it enough times, it becomes true. 
Um, there's really nothing to be done about them. Bane666 uploaded a series of videos absolutely 100% rebutting all the claims that Elliot Roger was in any way connected with the men's rights movement. And, you know, they, they've uh, gotten like precisely zero traction in the mainstream, right? The mainstream is going to say what it's going to say. Now, I was interested in what Chris Cantwell had to say um, because I was interested in exactly how much spin had been put on his beliefs and goals by Vice and other elements of the mainstream media. Now, as Allison and I discussed in our last rant, Zerker, regarding the Boston Free Speech Rally, I don't trust the corporate media to tell me or anyone else who is a racist, who is a Nazi, who is a fascist, and who isn't. Um, for instance, okay, just, just a general example. For instance, the press has smeared Trump as racist and fascist for wanting to stem the flow of illegal immigration to the U.S. Yet here's what our totally socially acceptable, non-racist, non-fascist, non-Nazi Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said only the other day in response to a flood of mostly Haitian migrants entering Canada illegally over the last few months. Canada is an open and welcoming society because Canadians have confidence in our immigration system and have confidence that we are a country based on laws. You will not be at advantage if you choose to enter Canada irregularly. You must follow the rules and there are many. Our number one job is to protect our citizens and we will enforce the existing rules to keep our communities safe. Now as far as anybody knows, none of these people are violent felons, um, but they're probably not going to be staying here in Canada. And if they do stay, they will have to go through the exact same legal process as anyone else and they'll do it while sitting in a detention center. Why? Because we are, in Trudeau's words, a country of laws and one that has every right to decide based on those laws and the safety and well-being of Canadian citizens who gets in and who does not. So why are there no anti-fascists holding signs, burning the maple leaf, and throwing bottles of urine at the Parliament building in Ottawa? The reality is Canada's immigration policies as they stand now and for a long time are much tighter than those in the U.S. It took 11 years of legal battles all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada for a South African family, three of whose members suffer from porphyria, an allergy to sunlight, to become permanent legal residents of Prince Rupert, BC, one of the most consistently cloudy places in the world. Now, why such a battle? Because immigration officials said they simply didn't qualify to stay in Canada and ordered them deported back to South Africa. They were eventually allowed to stay not on the grounds that they weren't felons, not on the grounds that they weren't illegally taking advantage of government benefits, not on the grounds that they were productive tax-paying members of Canadian society who weren't Turkin or gerbs, but on humanitarian grounds, successfully arguing that returning to South Africa would be the equivalent of a sentence of life in prison for the three family members afflicted with this disease. That's how tough it is to get into Canada if you're not a legitimate refugee. And if you fail to meet all of the requirements of our very strict immigration system, yet somehow Trump wanting to tighten the border to prevent illegal entry into the U.S. of unvetted individuals is fascism. And then this shows up on the cover of Rolling Stone. You want to know why he can't be our president? Well, number one... Pretty sure you wouldn't like his immigration policy. All of that aside, given the very mixed response from commenters and some discussion on Reddit that was spurred by the interview, I thought I would make my own position clear on where I agree with Cantwell and where I don't. So, here goes. First up, the IQ argument. And I'm going to address this first because it seems to have generated the most controversy and outrage out of everything in that interview. So I'm going to go into first where I agree with Cantwell. IQ is partially heritable. 
Um, there are differences between the races when measured in aggregate in terms of IQ, or perhaps I should say IQ potential is largely heritable and that IQ is positively correlated with achievement and income. Now, where I disagree with him, I disagree that heritability is particularly important when discussing race in the context of something like racial nationalism. Firstly, environmental factors can either hinder or facilitate any individual's ability to maximize the inherited potential in terms of IQ. So yes, there may be a hard ceiling that uh, an individual inherits uh, due to their genetic makeup, but I doubt many people of any race ever actually max out their potential. Uh, the factors that can impede uh, reaching that potential would include poverty, stress, exposure to chemicals, and lack of the types of stimulation required to create and prune neural connections. So environment does have a lot to do with whether you're able to actually really live up to your potential. Secondly, I disagree that IQ is the reason blacks are filling up our prisons, as he said. Um, this is partly true in as much as people with more intelligence and or more money, which is correlated with intelligence, are better able to avoid prison when they do commit crimes, or more able to bend the law just short of breaking it. Um, so they're, they're actually going to be able to judge um, how far they can push things before they're really technically over the line. Um, and there are a whole bunch of other factors that act as confounds. We can't ignore the fact that there is some detectable racial bias within the criminal system, and that this racial bias is going to be particularly hard on black men given the even larger gender bias. Um, we can't ignore the fact that the war on drugs, whether intentionally or not, singled out men of color for the harshest crackdowns and penalties. We can't ignore fatherlessness as a major component in terms of someone's likelihood of ending up in prison. Um, the problems with our system in terms of the people who have been convicted being handicapped in their success as law-abiding citizens after that. Um, so recidivism isn't, isn't always uh, precipitated by a predisposition to criminality, but by how the system is set up to make things impossible for people who have prior convictions to succeed as law-abiding citizens. Um, you can't ignore what I would call generational recidivism. If you lock dad away for 10 years and his son is fatherless, even if the family would have otherwise chosen to remain intact, um, if fatherlessness uh, creates a vulnerability in terms of particularly young men and crime, um, then taking someone's dad away for an extended period of time during their childhood is going to cause a generational effect. And we can't ignore income inequality or what Jordan Peterson calls, you know, relative poverty as opposed to absolute poverty. Um, this is actually a massive predictor of violence among young men in any given community. If young men don't perceive <clears throat> that they have a way of becoming relatively successful compared to the other men around them, you get all kinds of problems that can't be erased just by making sure everyone's above the poverty line and has enough to eat. And finally, culture can't be ignored either. Urban black subculture as exemplified by, I guess, the stereotypical sort of gangsta rap thing, um, that promotes certain ways of being in the world that may look tempting to young men with limited opportunities and uh, who have few adult male role models around during childhood to lead by example. A lot of kids in general won't have their first male teacher until eighth grade math. For boys growing up without dads, they're going to seek a masculine identity and sense of belonging somewhere. And for some, that's going to be among their same age or slightly older peers. Now, when a boy without a dad <clears throat> lives in a community where most of the families are intact and crime rates are low and he has friends with dads who he can spend time with and 
kind of, uh, you know, go on camping trips or, or whatever the fuck you want to, you want to say, or a coach or something, some man that he can actually attach to, who's going to give him a positive example. Um, that can compensate for the lack of a father. But when 75% of the other boys around you are also fatherless, um, and there really are very few examples of the sort of steady, stable, reliable uh, adult male role models that you might find in in a suburb full of intact families, um, you're gonna you're gonna have something completely different going on there. And finally, I would expect that pro propensity for crime has more to do with personality and temperament than it does to do with IQ. The idea that being less smart than the next person has more to do with committing crime than traits like agreeableness or conscientiousness is just silly to me. And to kind of put the period on this, um, I've heard a lot of leftists argue that conservatives are actually lower in IQ on average than liberals. But at the same time, conservatives are more rule conscious and uh, more conscientious and industrious, and they tend to prefer order to disorder. Now, does anyone think that conservatives are, as a group, um, predisposed based on their IQ to criminality? I don't think so. I think that these personality and temperamental traits have more to do with it. So the IQ argument in terms of incarceration is almost completely bunk. And I only say almost because there might be some correlation there, but if there is, it's buried under all kinds of confounds and it can't be assumed to be causal unless someone's going to show me evidence of that. And I doubt that what correlation may exist amounts to being uh, the primary factor um, in this. I, I don't think it really bears a whole lot of consideration as a factor at all. So, second thing. Do racial differences in IQ support the idea of racial segregation? Uh, well, okay, but why not just create a country based on IQ? You know, you must be this smart to enter. Uh, the reality is these broader patterns that are detectable across large populations of people can't really tell you anything meaningful about any given individual. Their proper use is when determining if outcomes as measured across similarly large populations would reflect what's expected in a just society. So, I mean, you might say men are on average more harshly treated in the criminal system than women. Well, you can't measure that simply by the fact that men are more likely to be incarcerated. Um, you actually have to figure out whether there's actual sexism going on. And even if there is actual sexism going on, this doesn't mean that any given man is going to be treated more harshly than every single woman. It doesn't prove sexism in every single case or comparison between men and women. It demonstrates sexism in general. And cases still need to be evaluated on an individual basis. Now, the fact that, as far as we can tell, this sort of systemic bias exists, on average, um, that doesn't mean I would ever support measures to, say, apply some kind of blanket 60% sentencing discount um, to every man who's currently uh, being sentenced for a crime or institute a quota to double the number of convictions of women to eliminate the, that disparity, or that we should offer all male inmates and no female inmates early release because those measures would completely ignore individual circumstances. There are plenty of cases where justice is being done, and I would really like to eliminate bias, not create new biases to try to compensate in the broad scale um, to get the numbers where they you know need to be um, I, I don't want anybody to be discriminated against as an individual in order to bring those numbers to the you know place where they need to be
Now, when it comes to IQ, there are plenty of really smart blacks and plenty of really dumb whites. So the entire IQ argument is a bit of a red herring. Um, and to address the people who have framed my position on IQ as dehumanizing blacks, there are a few things that I think need to be said. First, being less smart does not equal being less human. Um, I myself was in the 90, 98th and 99th percentiles in standard aptitude testing for pretty much everything when I was in school. We didn't do IQ tests per se, um, but it's pretty similar. My daughter's IQ was measured twice. Uh, she scored 110 in verbal IQ and 149 in per performance IQ. And my older son has an IQ of, I would estimate, at least 120, probably higher. Now, my youngest is above average, but he probably has a lower IQ than my other two children. Anybody who thinks that that's an argument that he's subhuman is an asshole. Secondly, I have spent nine years of my life discussing the biological... Uh, or biologically based psychological differences between men and women. Apparently, acknowledgement of biological differences between men and women makes me a male supremacist who is arguing that women are subhuman. Or perhaps it just means that biological differences exist and that these can be explanatory regarding some disparities in outcome. Thirdly, if the argument that group A has a lower average IQ than group B based in part on biological differences means I have said that group A are subhuman, then I'm actually a Jewish or Asian supremacist and have argued that whites are subhuman. And finally, appeals to context and consequences that it's okay to acknowledge sex differences, but not race differences, because there are people out there who will misuse the one but not the other, are not arguments. They're logical fallacies. A thing does not become less true simply because you wish it was less true, or because it makes you uncomfortable, or because some people will leap to conclusions you don't like based on it. Now, the science regarding these race differences exist. And the idea, right, if white supremacists are using average differences in IQ as an argument for discrimination or ethno-nationalism, I think we would all do better to stop covering our ears and screaming, that's just not true when so much of the evidence supports it being the case, and we'd be better off presenting an argument as to why those differences are broadly irrelevant. And I hope I have done some of that here. Now, for those who took issue with Cantwell's absurd assertion of fruit falling out of the trees in Africa, I, I'm, agree I'm gonna agree, right? That's ridiculous and fallacious um, in terms of what the conditions were like in Africa even, you know, ages and ages ago. Um, it was possibly the dumbest way of describing an actual thing. Uh, the actual thing being that settling as agrarians in climates where there is a growing season and a long dormant season would affect what traits are selected for. Um, things like delayed gratification right? You're not going to survive if you're unable to plan ahead and if you're not willing to be hungry all the time in order to resist eating your seed grain or killing your milk cow. Um, this isn't as much of a problem when food is available year-round and when you're sort of doing the hunter-gatherer version of living paycheck to paycheck. Um, and that's not to say that food is falling out of the sky in Africa. It's just that availability um, season to season is a little bit different and will select for different tra traits. Um, construction of shelter and preparations for isolation from communities due to inability to travel would be different if you had a winter to contend with and you're living in one place. 
Sub-zero temperatures and three feet of snow on the roof means you can't realistically live in a tent, um, at least not for long, and, uh, and you have to also construct shelters for any animals you have as well. So all of this is going to select for different approaches to surviving the environment, and therefore um, it's going to favor some traits over others. Um, one of the most interesting things, and I'm, I'm just going to use this as an example of what I'm getting at, uh, that, you know, I, I have read recently is some research on how ADHD, um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder might be an adaptation rather than a disorder. Um, researchers looked at the outcomes of individuals who display symptoms of ADHD among two genetically identical groups of people who regularly intermarry. One has a traditionally nomadic lifestyle, and the other recently, like over the last few decades, settled in one place and sort of has taken on a sedentary agrarian way of life. ADHD was associated with better outcomes uh, health-wise in the nomadic group and worse health outcomes um, in the sedentary group. And, you know, so we're looking at something that may have... Uh, really strong biological roots. And I would hope that the outcome of this research isn't a suggestion that we engage in eugenics in order to isolate and eliminate ADHD from the gene pool. Because obviously ADHD has certain advantages um, in terms of survival and reproductive outcomes and all of those things um, in certain contexts and environments. And you never know what's around the corner. Um, what I would hope is that ADHD stops being treated as a disorder that needs to be fixed with drugs and punitive measures, and that we as a society would do what we can to ensure uh, that our education system allows for this and helps individuals with ADHD survive and thrive every bit as well as everybody else. But, you know, that's just me. Now, on the question of tribalism, and whether it's a justification to create a white ethno-state. Um, yeah, tribalism exists. Yeah, racism exists. And no, the two are not synonymous. Not all tribalism is racism, but I would argue that all racism is tribalism. Not all dogs are poodles, but all poodles are dogs. Now, as I said in the interview, uh, babies begin showing a marked preference for people who look like my parents around the time they become ambulatory. In addition to that, they actually show a preference for people who sound like my parents pretty much immediately after they're born. And no, that doesn't mean they understand words, but they can detect enough differences in cadence and inflection between, say, English and Danish or Mandarin to demonstrate a greater interest in actively listening to someone who is speaking the language that they've been hearing through the uterine wall for the last weeks of a pregnancy. Now, I've seen some anti-SJWs, including Tucker Carlson, who I often enjoy watching, express absolute incredulity and shock and, you know, just they're absolutely outraged about this suggestion. Oh my God, they're saying white babies are racist. How ridiculous and offensive. Well, the reality is all babies do show a clear racial bias, not in terms of their own race, but the race of their parents. People who look like my parents are my kind and to be trusted, and people who look different from them are not my kind, and I should sound the alarm when they come near. This becomes measurable, um... Right around the time babies begin making strange with anyone who's not in their immediate family. Again, right around the time when they can start getting around on their own, and therefore they might begin to encounter unfamiliar people um, from outside of the umbrella of parental supervision and protection. Now, the best way to compensate for this sort of innate racism is like SJWs suggest passive exposure. 
um, passive exposure to people who have different skin color, who have different types of facial morphology, people who look different. Eventually, the baby will define my kind of people to include those people too. People who have different skin color, people who have different facial morphologies, and people who sound different when speaking. But all of this essentially indicates that babies are born with the wetware necessary to establish tribal boundaries. Who is the us and who is the them? Now, tribalism takes advantage of this mechanism um, and the biological equipment that we inherit in order to facilitate this mechanism. Um, it is a way in which we sort out who are insiders and who are outsiders. Who do I cooperate with and who do I exclude and mistrust? And it begins with who looks and sounds like mom and dad, but that's because babies are so cognitively immature that these are the only criteria that would make any sort of sense to babies of nine months of age. As humans develop a larger capacity for understanding the world around them and other people and prioritizing things in order of importance, they will begin sorting out the us and the other using criteria that are more important in context. A white conservative will believe he has more in common and in more important ways than skin color with Larry Elder or Jesse Lee Peterson than he has with AIDS Skrillex or Trigglypuff. A black leftist might have more in common and in more important ways than skin color with Bernie Sanders or George Takei than with Thomas Sowell or Ben Carson. What this necessarily means is that the idea of an ethnostate is as ludicrous and infantile as the idea of black self-segregation. It's a baby's understanding of the world and people, and it's a baby's understanding of who can I trust and who should I not trust. A tribe as we currently understand it is not defined by skin color, but by a set of common values and a common purpose. So Chris, I'm going to ask you, would you accept AIDS Skrillex or Trigglypuff into your ethno state? How about Hillary Clinton, Rachel Maddow? Riley J. Dennis, Amanda Marcotte. How about all the white Antifa activists who threw balloons full of piss at you in Charlottesville? Are they welcome? I mean, these are the individuals you have defined as the us according to the criteria you supposedly hold to be the most important. What about Elizabeth Warren? I mean, we all know her claims to indigenous American ancestry are bunk. You're stuck with her now. She's one of you. What about this bitch? Is she welcome in your white nation? Or are there other things you might consider more important than race? And finally, setting aside the reasonableness or otherwise of creating a white ethnostate, we really need to look at where we are now. We are not Japan. If we were, it would be totally easy and uncomplicated to just keep on keeping on the way we've always done things. But we're here in this room now, and it's a room with lots of non-whites in it. There is no way for America to create an all-white state without violence or coercion. And I'm sorry, but we really have to consider the fact that a lot of the people you would want to exclude, they aren't in the U.S. because they or their ancestors chose to be there. You know, I'm not someone who buys into the idea of white guilt over the legacy of slavery. I think it's stupid and unproductive, and I, I think it's unjust to try to hold the whites who are alive today collectively responsible for what happened before they were born or collectively responsible for the racism of other whites. I think it's retarded and bigoted to act like whites invented slavery or like they were the only group in history that ever engaged in it. It's, it's complete bunk. It's, it's, a, it's a complete non-argument. It's stupid. And, and it's hateful. All of that said, 
I think it's kind of a dick move to look at a group of people who are only here because their ancestors were forcibly removed from their homes and their lives and brought here against their will by the ancestors of your people and say to those those people, yeah, we whites don't want you here. Pack your shit and get out. I mean, how just is it to, for example, cordon off a city and expel all the people of color who were born there and built their lives there over generations in some cases? Or are we talking about finding some piece of unclaimed land and starting from scratch? How viable is that? You ever lived in a wilderness area? I have. You know, with pretty much nothing. A sheet of plastic and an axe. You know, survive minus 30 weather. It ain't fun. So exactly how are you proposing that this be done? And how would Triglypuff make herself useful in your built-from-scratch white ethnostate? I mean, she has just as much right to be there as you do, Chris. Because it's all about race, isn't it? It's not about how you think or what you're capable of contributing. Weisheit über alles. We're in this room now. And the answer to being in this room is not to try to turn back the clock and go back to when it was all white, which it never really was, but to figure out the best way for everybody to coexist in this room. The answer is not to blame all differences in outcome on biological factors and leave it at that, but to try to build a society where everybody, including blacks and other people of color, have an equal opportunity and ability to succeed and be produ productive. And you and those who agree with you, you talk a lot about white genocide. And the answer to that, if one is actually necessary, is for white people to start having babies, not for us to self-segregate into what will inevitably become, if demographic patterns hold, an ever smaller territory that eventually dwindles into nothing. We need to decide what is more important to us, our values, or our skin color, our culture, or our skin color, our achievements, or our skin color, our way of doing things, or our skin color, the ideals under which we have organized ourselves, individualism, meritocracy, an assumption of equal dignity, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, all of those things, regardless of how right or wrong we might get those things at any given time, right? Or how attainable they are. Those things or our skin color. Because if anything can be said to have brought white people to where they are, right? To where they are, their position in the world, right? It's not their whiteness. It's their embracing of those things. And yes, I understand that the rise of white nationalism is in large part a response to the race baiting and the white privilege narrative of the left. I understand that if the left and people of color are going to insist on having identity politics based on race, it's hypocritical to say, Identity politics for everybody. Oh, except whites and especially white males. Because, you know, that's just different. I understand that whites, and particularly white men, feel bashed at the moment, and that the mainstream is happy to bash them, and that this bashing has actually been institutionalized, and it has been institutionalized for decades. I understand that in the current political climate, it is open season on white people and particularly on white men. I understand that there needs to be a pushback. And especially after Boston, there needs to be a serious pushback against false narratives regarding the media labeling people as Nazis, fascists, and white supremacists. And maybe you are part of that necessary pushback. But that doesn't mean that I think you're right. Anyhow, I hope that this clarifies where I stand on all of this. 
Um, I hope that I, I hope that I have made my position clear on what Chris Cantwell had to say, and and I hope that I have maybe given him a counter argument to consider. Um, I do believe that. Uh, Unlike the media narrative that says that Antifa and these, uh, these groups um, that are getting more and more violent, are they exist in response to the rise of white nationalism. I think they have their causality backwards. Um, I think that white nationalism would have been everybody's inbred ugly cousin who they don't bother inviting to Thanksgiving. Um, and they would have stayed that way if not for this constant barrage of white bashing, this constant white privilege, white oppressor narrative, and this stance on the part of the left um, that everybody is a fascist. So essentially, um, I think that they, they have things very much backwards, but I don't see anything justifiable um in the response uh in i don't see anything good in the equal and opposite response um on the part of white nationalists and uh i really really wish that everybody could just stand down because i i don't see anything pleasant coming out of any of it so um, that's why I talked to Chris Cantwell, that's why I wanted to understand his point of view, and, uh, and that's why I, uh, I think that just labeling people's, people Nazis and fascists and, uh, and prohibiting their right to speak isn't gonna work, so. Anyhow, that's it for me. See you later.